oh my gosh, this workshop yesterday was something. Um, we were able to really go some places, um, and I really went to a place because um, I don't know if I kind of got volunteered initially, but I, I, it was the one-on-one -on -one demonstration that I got to take a topic, and he was able to work through his six steps to create some healing for me. And it was spectacular because it's something that had been on my mind all week. And so I was like, okay, how do we do this? So, but I think if you don't mind, can we play? You have the video back yeah, there, a little right? Intro. Yeah, a little I'll intro video. It up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you've got it's just a little intro video about me and my stories. You're you're in control. He's got. The, I got it. Okay. Here we go. I think. On. Um, advance. Something's not working. What's up? <laughs> uh, it's on. There you go. You got to press the right button, Michael. Do you ever feel like maybe you're just too sensitive for the world? I used to feel like that too. Then something happened. So when I was really young, I was just a complete free spirit. I was like a total ball of light. Hello, welcome to music land. In flow state all the time. Another girl. But then when I was in my teens, it became pretty obvious that like I didn't fit the mold. And I became really anxious and had panic attacks. Went to business school, didn't fit in, came out didn't fit in, became a model, didn't fit in. I even went through ex-gay therapy, hoping that would help, but thank God didn't. I was in a pretty dark place. Then when I was 24, I met a healer who completely changed my life. I learned to stop fighting against myself and to listen to the wisdom in my own body for my own truth and healing. I, I found this river of peace that I had been searching so badly for. For the past decade, I've been obsessed with uncovering the truth of who I am. I remain a student of life and have had so many amazing teachers, guides, mentors, and friends along the way. It kind of gave me permission to just to be. To be. And that did. Oh, it's an idea of life. It's not life. Today, I embrace the gifts of sensitivity and I love working with people as a coach and a healer. My mission is to help people connect to their true nature. And I'd love to provide you with tools and experiences to assist you on your journey too. Awesome. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. And Michael, I do want to quickly say that, um, yeah. you know, you got a glimpse of me at, at an early teenage there. And, um, it was a really tough time for me being a teenager. It was a time that I really started to struggle with, uh, reconciling my spirituality, which was really dear to me growing up. I sang in a church and I really felt this strong connection to God. And, um, as I was grappling with, um, being a, a gay kid, you know, I started to really question my place with God and also in the world. And, um, and there's this, you know, younger part of myself that has always kind of felt split off because of that. And when I went to the Unitreat, I went there as a chaperone, assuming I was going there to support other youth. And I did, but what I really came back with was a tremendous healing, um, feeling so loved and embraced by youth at that age that I associated with being my bullies. And I remember especially the youth from Unity of Louisville just being so incredibly loving, like Michael back there and Bastion and others. And um, it, it absolutely was a life changer for me. Absolutely. So and yeah. they know the story, so they've already heard how they did the same thing to me. Oh, really? Yeah. One of my talks was about how I had been bullied so much by teenagers and young people, and to see them in that space, loving each other and supporting. And I even told them, you know, some of the people were bad when they did the talent show. They just weren't good at all. Yeah. And they all <laughs> stood up and clapped and did a standing ovation. And I looked at Chelsea and Kimberly and I said, my God, this is euphoria. When people love each other, no matter how they show up. So thank you for sharing that. Cause it's funny that we're both on the yeah, same yeah. thing with that. So, um, now that I know how that video makes you feel, yeah. I'm sitting over here kind of tearing up because I'm seeing you remembering all those same feelings that I had. I mean, I don't know if you all know about conversion therapy, but it's not a great thing. And so um, I'm sorry that you had to experience that. And I'm glad you looked over it because <laughs> the gay world needs you. Okay. 
We do. We need beautiful people that are deep and connected like you are. Um, so yesterday at the workshop, Unlocking the Wisdom of the Felt Sense, you talked about the intersection between the human experience and the spiritual dimension, or higher self, we call it. Our own Eric Butterworth says, God is spirit present in its entirety in every point in space and at the same time. So yesterday, when you went over this intersection, it really hit home to me. As a matter of fact, I got so excited about it, and I couldn't remember what it was. I'm like, here, we're calling the altar, Reverend Dr. Paul Hasselback, and we're going to ask him what it is. And he answered. <laughs> so we both got to share a few moments with him about what is that point. So can you share with us kind of what that yeah, is? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, something happened here. Let me go back for a second if I can. So... Um, you know, and it's interesting because trauma causes us to kind of split in different ways. And it can cause us to split from our mind and our body. It can cause us to split from our connection to the divine, of which we are always apart, but we have this kind of temporary illusion of separation. And um, so the work of the felt sense, which we'll dive into a little bit more in this talk, I'm sure, um, is about really connecting to in the moment what is happening within ourselves and our bodies, which is irrefutable. No one can really argue with what that experience is individually right now in this present moment. We might have thoughts going on. We might have emotions that we are experiencing. But right now, your experience of being human in this moment is this beautiful doorway between your human experience and your divinity shining through. So um, this model, I really enjoy because it kind of helps to illustrate that. So if we think about this world of duality which we are inhabiting and um, the constant change that we are experiencing, whether that's internally, out in the world, um, that is this horizontal time-space continuum plane. And then we have the vertical axis being our connection to the divine, um, our embodiment of divine nature, the changeless spiritual essence of who we are. And when we feel most healthy and at peace is when we are on this intersection point, which we call the present moment, where all of that comes together, where the, the seemingly contradicting parts of ourselves are accepted and loved. And um, that's where I, I see healing is happening. And um, it's a, it's a, place where we can ask ourselves this beautiful question, what is being experienced right here in the here and the now? And it becomes a doorway to get outside of our rational mind, which can be sometimes limiting. Um, there's a quote by Einstein, which is that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And when we move into that intersection point, we start to embody an experience that allows us to elevate our consciousness to solve problems from a very different perspective. We can move into oneness consciousness. We find ways to creatively express ourselves that might have bypassed our rational mind. We become the true embodiment of the divine in our incarnate self. And so I just love looking at this diagram. It really helps me when I'm kind of checking in with myself to see where am I operating? Because if I am identified with snapshots of my life, the past stories about myself, or future snapshots that are taking me out of this present moment experience, that's where suffering resides. And that is sort of like being spread out on that horizontal line. So the goal then is to get to that intersection. Right. That intersection. So, mm -hmm. and I think how many people in here feel like sometimes you're not in that intersection? <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh. It's like, please drive me to the intersection. But it's hard. We're surrounded in this world with so many things, with political things, with literally war. All of these things create that line to not be there and not taking us back to that intersection. So it's really our job and our role, and that's what his mission is about, is trying to get back 
to that felt sense to where we can truly embody that, like he said, and become that because then our decisions we make go forth from a place of the divine, from a place that's of love and peace and joy, not of the chaos that's out there. So, all right, I'm going to move forward. Is that? Yeah. Yep. All right, great. Um, so tell me about the inner orchestra model. I, I love this as a you know, piano player, musician myself. And of course, I've done a lot of work. Uh, I shouldn't say work. I've read a lot of um, the work from, um, I want to say Richard Schwartz. Schwartz yeah. Rick, yeah. Richard. Yep. Yep. Uh, some people call him Dick Schwartz. Some people call him Richard. Um, but I love that. When I took that class with Martha, she had a class on internal family systems. It created such a shift in me because I don't know if you all remember, but years ago, that was called multiple personality problem, right? Now we're embracing these parts. Can you talk about this more? Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, this idea of being on this intersection point is, what's that? Oh, um, is, right, just, just having the compassion for all of the different parts that we inhabit in our lives. And ultimately, it puts us in a position where we can do the same thing as we look out in the world. So if we take this a step higher and a more meta, like a more meta level, we can think about how we are all one being. And as we look out on the world, not only do we have these parts within ourselves, but in a way, every single human being is a part of us too. And so the degree to which we can have loving compassion for all of these different aspects of us allows us to do the same for others. But there's a model that I think can be really helpful, which is the inner orchestra model. It's um, a derivative off of something that Richard Schwartz, the creator of Internal Family Systems, talks about. There we go. All right, so if you think about your internal world like an inner orchestra hall, um, imagine that the walls of the orchestra hall are like the boundaries of yourself. Sometimes it's appropriate to have those open uh, for connection, healing. Sometimes it's appropriate to close those off. Inside the orchestra hall, you have all of these different parts and players that are in the orchestra pit, and they all represent these different parts of you. Um, you could think about them like different sections. Sometimes they might be calling out for your attention, like I have illustrated. Oh, I got a point up there. Is that how this works? Okay, there we go. All right, so um, if you imagine where we have those little red dots, as you're sitting here right now, for example, maybe just close your eyes, just, just give us a shot. So just close your eyes and imagine this inner orchestra hall and just take inventory right now of what's going on in your mind in your body and just imagine that there's these little parts that are calling out for your attention right now. Maybe they're expressing problems. Maybe they're expressing possibilities. All of them making up you. And to the degree that you can have a, a loving, compassionate relationship with those parts, yet not completely identify with them allows you to play your part as your true nature, as the conductor of that inner orchestra. So I know this will be hard to look at with your eyes closed, but I'm gonna advance to the next slide. If you look at that X there, that is your true nature. So this kind of goes back to the previous diagram where we think about that intersection point between our divinity and our human experience. This is another way to look at it, thinking about your role as the conductor on that inner orchestra and, um, and your connection with all of your different parts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, I have to say that once I started, we named our parts, right? So Martha had us do cards and we named them. And I mean, I had all kinds of parts that I did not realize that I had that were guiding me. I had a mama part and she was out there, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I had a drag queen part that she was really, really, she would tell me crazy things. I had parts that were loving parts. I had parts that were scared. Who I feared parts, broken parts. So, you know, then I talked about it. I would go into meditation and start having tea with these parts. Let's just have tea. I know you're scared. I get that. 
This is the observer, right? You see that divinity is the observer that we are seeing our divinity, seeing into these parts. And I can remember how I started becoming, um, having relationships with these parts and it started shifting. I started noticing my fear and some of the things in my life starting to dissipate because now I was honoring them. Mm -hmm. A whole different world. Yep, exactly. And, that, and one of the ways that I, with, in my own world, will think about whether or not I'm on that conductor podium is just taking inventory within myself. So to the degree that I feel like I am centered and at peace is a really good indicator that I feel pretty firmly planted on that conductor podium right now. And to the degree, the, the degree that I feel like there's tension taking over me or um, there's, there's like an enormity of confusion, it might be that I am not occupying that role entirely. And it, it might be calling for ways in which I can be more loving and curious about the parts of myself that are calling out for help in the moment. All right, so I know you're not going to believe this, but we're nearing the end. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> I've got a clock and I never watch it, but yeah. in this position, I get to see it. Sure, lovely. Yeah. And most of the time, I don't want to see it. It's like, if I'm on a roll, let me go. That's it. So how can we put this to practice in our life? Yesterday, obviously, I was an example of that, but um, you know, we had some things. How do we um, get to the point where we're able to be at that intersection more effectively uh, yeah. to make our lives better. Yeah. So yesterday we, uh, we explored this process called focusing, which is based on a book concept um, by Eugene Gendlin. And actually, um, I'll show a slide in a second, but if you want to access some of the content from the workshop yesterday, you can go to my website, kindreds.us. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get this eventually. It's weird, I know. Uh, what's happening? You go to kindreds.us, we'll send the link out too, but there's a free course you can access. Um, there we go, thank you. So you can actually access the content from yesterday's workshop online for free. So you can go there. There's this six step process of focusing, which um, encourages you to, number one, take inventory of that inner orchestra within yourself, and then access the felt sense as it arises within yourself around a certain problem and then there's some techniques to connect with it from your rational mind to the nonlinear part of yourself to build a bridge and then to create some, some wisdom that can emerge from the felt sense. So that's a technique. There are so many different ways to do this. Um, some people yesterday talked about journaling, um, uh, automatic writing, and other kind of artistic expressions that allow us to connect more deeply to these parts. Um, I think that there's an infinite number of ways to do this. The, the main thing is just having the openness and curiosity and compassion for yourself to connect more deeply to that which wants to be expressed. Yes. Coming back to the present and that present moment being that intersection. When I was doing Doreen's beautiful memorial last Sunday, if you didn't get to come, it was truly spectacular and seeing how, what a great person she was. But the word that kept coming to me, and Doreen has a way of doing this, was presence, presence. Everything kept saying presence. So I shared that with him. And um, so presence, coming back to that so that we acknowledge it and then set intention that we're going to work through this. We're going to get back to that intersection. I'm going to ask you one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, um, where do you see us now? Where do you see us moving forward in the world? And um, how can we participate in the evolution of consciousness, because a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed in a lot of ways right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a huge question, um, it, but it's a good one. I think that, you know, a lot of us feel really overwhelmed right now. There's an enormity of change happening in so many different ways. It feels chaotic. We feel like we're out of control sometimes. And what I really like to remember, something I talked about yesterday, is just that we all, all of us, have a little corner of the universe that is ours to tend to. And I think that we can have more confidence that we are tending to that corner of the universe when we feel peaceful within ourselves. It's an indication that we are being of service to the highest degree and, um, and we know our boundaries. 
And so I think that it's really important to just trust that felt sense around that and to let go of that which is not ours to do. And um, for me, the uh, overwhelmment subsides when I know that I'm doing all that I can that is mine to do. And I, um, and I also have enough compassion to let go when it's, it's time to take care of myself so that I can continue showing up as authentically as possible. I love that. And so for me, what I heard was just do the work here, right? We're not going to be able to change the world as one person at a time, but we can change the world we're in. And I think that's it. Staying, just staying in our lead, sometimes keeping in our own lane. And that doesn't mean helping support and promote and creating justice for people and things like that. But again, still staying in that lane, knowing that that we really have to make the change within ourselves before we feel that change in the world. Well, and I also think it leads to inspired action that, um, that ripples out in so many different ways. And so it may look like concrete action out in the world. Um, it may inspire people to, um, to stand on their conductor podium and to show up authentically. I think that's, that's the key. And it, it's obvious that, you know, we're being asked to move into a higher state of consciousness as, as a human race. And, um, and that starts within, with each and one, every one of us beginning to model that more and more clearly and showing others what is possible. I think that's what's exciting about this idea of the felt sense is that there's something emerging within all of us that is wanting a different experience for ourselves and for others, for the entire planet. And to the degree to which we are able to listen to that, we can allow a new sto story to emerge and we can um, inspire others to do the same. Awesome. Michael Swigel, thank you for sharing your love. Your thank, you. thank you. Awesome. Brother, you're the best. <laughs>